You are listening to The Loop Podcast, a project in plastic surgery innovation. Hello, and thank you for joining The Loop Podcast. My name is Dr. Casey Sheck, and I'm happy to be joined by one of my co-residents and the creator of the intro music you just listened to for the podcast, Dr. Alec Fisher. Thank you so much for joining us. Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Hey, everyone. Hey, Loop listeners. Very excited to be here with Casey today. My name's Alec. I'm from Los Angeles. I'm the PGY2 Integrated Plastic Surgery Resident at Cooper, and I'm super excited to go over the topic of hand nerves as it pertains to plastic and reconstructive surgery. Leading up to the in-service exam, this is a highly testable area and a good way to get some points. It is not meant to be a comprehensive review, but we want to point out some of the highlights and these commonly asked topics and syndromes and points of compression in the upper extremity. Great. For nerve injuries, let's start on overall nerve injuries. For peripheral nerves, let's start with a question, Alec, about nerve transection and repair. What type of gap lengths make you change your thinking for answering the in-service questions? The magic number here is three centimeters. Under three centimeters, you want to do a primary repair. You may need to do a transposition of the nerve and free it up in order to get a primary repair without tension. If it's longer than three centimeters, you got to start thinking about autografting with some of the nerves from your own body, like a sural nerve graft or MABC or LABC or the superficial perineal nerve. And then the other thing to keep in mind is if you have a high nerve injury or a big important nerve, you may have a mixed motor and sensory branches that you need to cable graft for the multiple segments. Casey, what about acellular autografts? Yeah, so this is popping up a little bit more now. uh, And the way that I think about this is that this is an option, but only in short gaps. So those short gaps are going to be less than three centimeters that can't be brought together after you do transposition. And you would only be doing this if you didn't want any donor site morbidity. The patient's already had other nerves taken and you don't have anything that is readily available. You can use some of the acellular autograft. The other thing that I will mention is that when you're asked a question about a high or proximal motor nerve laceration, you should always consider about a distal nerve transfer. A favorite on the in-service is the AIN transfer to the ulnar nerve. This is with a high ulnar nerve injury, which is going to be defined as anything proximal to the branches innervating the FCU and the FDPs. So now talking about nerve injuries overall, Alec, do you want to talk to us a little bit about the Sunderland-McKinnon versus the Seden classifications? Yeah. So first there was a Seden classification, which has three main points, neuropraxia, axon temesis, and neurotemesis. And then Sunderland and McKinnon sort of flush these points out with six degrees or grades of nerve injury. So let's start with the most simple one, which is neuropraxia. This is the Sunderland-McKinnon first degree nerve injury. And this is where you get a block of conduction at the site of injury in the nerve, but the nerve itself is not injured. Next, we have the axon temesis, which is the Sunderland-McKinnon grade two and grade three and grade four. Grade two is a partial axon injury where you have intact endoneurium, perineurium, and epineurium. Grade three is where the axon and the endoneurium are both disrupted, so you have a variable recovery. You can have a complete recovery of the axon, or you may have no recovery whatsoever. And finally, in grade four, this is a little more serious of an injury, and this is where the axon, endoneurium, and perineurium are disrupted. And this is going to form a scar in the nerve at the site of injury. Sometimes these injuries can be called neuroma incontinuity, is you may have some nerve transmission distally after this heals, but likely you'll have a painful neuroma and loss of some motor and or sensory function. So you need further testing to figure out whether you need to operate on these people. Then we have to talk about neurotemesis. This is where you get injury to the nerve or complete transection, also called a grade five Sunderland-McKinnon classification. You're not going to get any recovery of this nerve unless you intervene. One of the ones that doesn't really fit into a category is the Sunderland-McKinnon grade six, and this is kind of a mixed bag injury. You get variable injury along the length of a nerve, so you can expect a mixed recovery depending on how bad the damage is. In order to figure out what type of injury the patient has, it's better to do some diagnostic testing prior to going to the OR. Casey, you want to talk about some of these studies? Yeah, absolutely. So this is going to be your EMGs and your neuroconductive studies. What you want to know about these are just kind of very, keep it simple, 
keep the findings in front of you and understand what they mean. When they talk about latency, this is going to be how long it takes for an impulse to travel down the nerve. This relates to the velocity of conduction that you're allowed to have through it based on the myelinated fibers. And if you think about that, if you have decreased velocity or an increased latency, this is going to show that you have demyelination of that nerve. One of the other things you want to look at is your amplitudes. If you have a decreased amplitude, that means that you have axonal damage. And then some of the things you want to know about for the EMG is that if you see fibrillations or sharp waves, this is a sign of de-innervation. These are muscles that do not have innervation actively going to them. And you're going to usually see that starting around post-injury day 7 to 10. You want to know about the abnormal conduction velocities. So if you're given a latencies are greater than 3.5 or 4.5, for sensory or motor, those are abnormal. And then any of the amplitudes, so the snap amplitude less than 15 millimeters is going to be abnormal. You should know though that conduction studies cannot determine the difference between exonotemesis with a favorable outcome versus neurotemesis, which is not favorable. One of the things you can look at is an advancing Tunnel sign is a favorable sign as you are having progression of the nerve. So Alec, let's dive into some specifics about these nerves. Yeah, this is all highly testable and pretty difficult. Some of this is memorization of where the nerves compress, and the other one is the application of upper extremity anatomy. I always get frustrated with this topic, but it's important to just keep reviewing it, do some questions. And Casey, let's go over some of the highlights. Yeah, I find it really important when you're talking about nerves of the upper extremity to understand the major nerves starting off, what they innervate, common compression points, like you said. With that said, we're going to run through these pretty quickly, the major nerves and some high yield points. After this, we'll touch on the brachial plexus quickly and then a couple other high yield points that fall into this category. So starting with the ulnar nerve, Alec, why don't you give us a little overview of the anatomy and then we'll go on to the innervation and syndromes. The ulnar nerve is my favorite nerve. It is from the C8 to T1 nerve roots. It goes into the lower trunk and then is a terminal branch of the medial cord. It travels posterior to the brachial artery in the upper arm, pierces through the medial intermuscular septum, and then across the medial side of the triceps. It crosses the elbow posterior to the medial epicondyle, which is also known as the funny bone. The ulnar nerve then enters the forearm and runs between the flexor carpi ulnaris and the ulnar side of the flexor digitorum profundus, both of which it innervates. It then crosses the wrist ulnarly and innervates a majority of the intrinsic hand muscles, 14 of the 19 to be exact. These include the hypothenar muscles, the ulnar two lumbricals, the adductor pollicis, all seven palmar and dorsal interossei, and the palmaris brevis. Casey, do you want to talk about the sensory innervations of the ulnar nerve? Absolutely. So the ulnar nerve is responsible for a sensation of the small finger and the ulnar side of the ring finger and the associated palm area. More specifically, you're going to have the palmar cutaneous branch, which gives sensation to the hypothenar eminence and ulnar palm, and then the dorsal branch that originally runs deep to the FCU rises to innervate the dorsum of the ulnar hand. Knowing possible points of compression along the anatomical path of any of these nerves is really important, especially here for the ulnar nerve. So Alec, you want to talk about the first point of compression? Yeah. I think the first point we need to talk about is cubital tunnel syndrome. This is the most common site of ulnar nerve compression, and it's between the medial epicondyle, the two heads of the FCU aponeurosis. Another point of compression up there by the elbow is the Osborne's ligament. Another one is the arcade of Struthers which is a hiatus in the medial intermuscular septum, about 8 centimeters proximal to the medial epicondyle. This is different from the ligament of Struthers, which we'll talk about in a bit. The arcade of Struthers is a point of compression that you want to think about after a patient had a cubital tunnel release and still is symptomatic. Finally, the ulnar nerve can get compressed by the anconius muscle at the terminal end of the triceps between the medial epicondyle and the olecranon. Yeah, it should be known that if cubital tunnel syndrome is suspected, a pure release of the compression points may not be enough to resolve your problems. This is because of the superficial location of the ulnar nerve through the cubital tunnel. As your elbow bends, it increases tension and traction, leading to stretch and compression of the nerve. So this would drive you to transpose the nerve to a more anterior position that is 
This is kind of championed by Dr. Susan McKinnon, and she has great papers on that. I highly recommend going over those while you're studying. The next site of possible compression is actually at the wrist in Guyon's canal. Prior to entering the canal, you need to remember that the nerve actually divides into the superficial and deep branches. It's because of this that if you're looking at a patient that has isolated intrinsic weakness without any sensory changes, it's most likely going to be secondary to the deep branch, either an injury or a compression, and therefore you can rule out a cubital tunnel compression or injury as all of those are going to carry a sensory component. Let's talk about that ulnar compression at the wrist. Guyon's canal is a little box, the radial side being the hook of the hamate, the ulnar side being the pisiform and the pisohamate ligament, the roof is the volar carpal ligament, and the floor are the hypothenar muscles. So when you perform a Guyon's canal release, you have to release the pisohamate ligament and the volar carpal ligament. Guyon's canal compression patients have sensory sparing usually on the dorsal ulnar hand, well, unlike these cubital tunnel patients. Exactly. I think it's also a good time to go over what happens with ulnar nerve injuries that lead to intrinsic hand weakness. So this will cause the ulnar claw, as you've heard before, which is clawing of the ring and small finger. And this is due to unopposed long extensors of the ring and small finger due to the now non-functioning intrinsic muscles associated with the ring and small finger. There's always a bunch of signs with eponyms that are loved to be tested. There's two here for the ulnar nerve injuries. Alec, you want to give us those two signs? Yeah, the first of those two is froment signs. And this is when you ask a patient to grab a piece of paper between your thumb and the radial side of the index finger. A normal grip of a piece of paper there, your thumb would be straight, meaning no flexion at the IP joint and you, they pinch down on the paper using the adductor pollicis muscle. If a patient has ulnar nerve pathology, the adductor pollicis muscle isn't going to bring the thumb down, so the patient will flex their IP of the thumb using the FPL, which is median nerve innervated. So they'll have a flexion in the IP joint, which is a positive sign leading you to think of ulnar nerve injury. The second sign they like to ask you about is Wartenberg's sign. This is persistent small finger abduction and extension when you ask the patient to try and adduct all the fingers or bring them all together. And this is due to the weakness of the third palmar interosseous and the small finger lumbricle, which are normally innervated by the deep branch of the ulnar nerve. People will complain of their small finger catching when they try to put their hands in their front pockets. That's a really good point, Alec. The stems will kind of give you give some of these away, and then knowing these signs is a great thing to catch an extra point here or there. Once again, to differentiate from cubital tunnel versus Guillain's canal compression, cubital tunnel syndrome or any of the compressions in the proximal region are going to actually have less clawing of the ring and small finger because the FDP to the ring and small finger have lost innervation. You will also have sensory deficits on the dorsum of the hand because the more proximal compression injuries will get that before the branching prior to Guillain's canal. Now we're going to move on to the median nerve. Alec, you want to go over the median nerve anatomy? Oh yeah. Median nerve gets fibers from all of the roots in the brachial plexus. I'm talking C5 through T1. It forms from two cords of the brachial plexus, or the medial cord, which is mostly motor, and the lateral cord, which is mostly sensory. It then crosses the elbow in the AC fossa, and the nerve runs under Lacertus fibrosis, which is also the bicipital aponeurosis. It then enters the forearm between the humeral and the ulnar head of the pronator teres. The nerve is going to give off branches to innervate most of the volar side of the forearm. It innervates the pronator teres, palmaris longus, FDS, and FCR. It's then going to give off a branch, the anterior interosseous nerve, and continue on as the median nerve. The anterior interosseous nerve is the deep branch of the median nerve, and this is going to supply the deeper volar forearm muscles, specifically FDP of the index and middle finger, pronator quadratus, and FPL. There are some sensory fibers in the AIN, and this innervates the wrist, but doesn't go up to any levels of the skin. Yeah, so the main median nerve continues on and it gives off the palmar cutaneous branch. This is about five centimeters proximal to the wrist crease and just radial to the palmaris longus tendon. 
This innervates the skin over the thenar eminence and can help distinguish carpal tunnel syndrome from a more proximal nerve damage. The next branch is the recurrent motor branch, which innervates the thenar muscles, the abductor pollicis brevis, the superficial aspect of the flexor pollicis brevis, and the opponent's pollicis. The terminal branch of the median nerve is the palmar digital branch, and this is innervating the radial two lumbricals and the sensation over the palmar thumb and index middle and radial side of the ring finger. I think we're getting into a little bit of a flow here. Alec, let's go on to compression like we did for the other ones. You got it. Median nerve compression. You want to think about the ligament of Struthers. Note this is not the arcade of Struthers we talked about earlier. This is an anatomic variant that arrives from the supracondylar process of the humerus and attaches the medial epicondyle. This can cause proximal, pretty high up, medial nerve compression. The next one is the Lacertus fibrosis, the bicipital aponeurosis, because the nerve travels right under it. And then another one which we want to be aware of is the pronator teres, because it travels between the deep and superficial heads of the muscle, and this can result in pronator syndrome, which we'll talk about. And then finally, the last point of compression is the FDS, because it travels between these two heads a little bit further down in the forearm. Casey, why don't you tell us about the three most common pathologies of median nerve compression? Yeah, absolutely. So most common one we hear about is carpal tunnel syndrome. Symptoms are usually numbness and tingling in the median nerve distribution of the fingers with severe cases or prolonged compression causing wasting of the thenar muscles. It's good to remember that the palmar cutaneous branch comes off the median nerve just before the carpal tunnel, where the recurrent motor branch comes off at the distal end of the carpal tunnel. While there can be many anatomical variances, it's always important to be cognizant of this nerve when doing the carpal tunnel release, looking out for that recurrent motor branch. Anatomically, the carpal tunnel is made up of the transverse carpal ligament, which spans from the hamate and the triquetrum on the ulnar side to the scaphoid and the trapezium on the radial side. Treatment for this, you want to start off conservative, so wrist splinting in a neutral position at night. Uh, There have been many studies that show that splinting at night is equivocal to splinting for 24 hours, so there's no need to keep people splinted all day long. Following up with that, you want to prescribe NSAIDs. The next step would be a corticosteroid injection. These can actually work for about 6 to 12 months, but then if you fail conservative measures, you're going to move on to the surgical options. These are going to be either an endoscopic or an open carpal tunnel release. It's good to know that questions have been asked in the past about the difference between the two surgical techniques, open versus endoscopic. There have been multiple studies now showing that there are no statistically significantly different numbers when returning to work post-operative pain and recuperation. The one thing that has been found to be significant and is tested is that endoscopic carpal tunnel releases have a slightly higher recurrent median nerve injury versus open. So after carpal tunnel syndrome, Alec, what's the next syndrome we want to talk about? Yes, there's two more syndromes to keep in mind for the median nerve. The first is pronator syndrome, and the name really helps you out. It's where the median nerve gets compressed through the two heads of the pronator. The key to differentiating this from carpal tunnel syndrome is you get a mixed sensory and motor deficits distally, and you have sensory changes over the thenar eminence and palm because of the compression, the nerve proximal to the palmar cutaneous branch. You'll see weakness in the median innervated intrinsic and extrinsic muscles of the hand. The final syndrome which they want to talk about or bring up is anterior interosseous syndrome or AIN syndrome. This one, because of the AIN nerve, is a pure motor picture with no sensory disturbances. You'll have weakness of the deep forearm muscles, specifically the ones the AIN innervates, FPL, FDP, the index and long, and the pronator quadratus. Remember the pronator teres? Well, that was innervated proximal to the AIN branch, so it's not involved. All right, Casey, I think it's time we move on to the radial nerve. Absolutely. The last of the big three for the lower arm. So the radial nerve is one of the two terminal branches of the posterior cord. It arises from the C6, 7, and 8 nerve roots. And the other terminal branch of the cord is the axillary nerve. So the anatomy of the nerve is really important to understand. As it lies anterior to the long head of the tricep, right near the spiral groove of the humerus, it then innervates the triceps, pierces the intermuscular septum, and this is going to be located 10 centimeters proximal to the lateral epicondyle. 
Then it sends some branches to the brachialis and innervates the aconeus and the ECRL. This is prior to it going into the AC fossa. As the radial nerve then enters the forearm, anterior to the lateral epicondyle, it divides into the the radial superficial nerve and the deep, which is going to be the PIN or the posterior interosseous nerve. The PIN enters the arcade of froze, and this is through the supinator. The PIN supplies the supinator and then all the muscles of the extensor compartment. So think about all of the, the extensors, so the APL, EPB, ECRB. EDC, EDM, EIP, EPL, ECU, lots of acronyms, but just think about it as the extensor compartments are going to be supplied by the PIN. The nerve then terminates with a radial carpal joint sensation. Once again, the PIN, just like the AIN, does not have any cutaneous sensational fibers. Following the radial nerve, the radial sensory nerve branches from the main trunk at the lateral humeral epicondyle and courses below the brachioradialis. Going through the forearm up to the wrist, it crosses the anatomic snuff box between EPB and EPL, and this gives sensation to the dorsal aspect of the thumb, the index, long, and the radial half of the ring finger up to the DIP. So the dorsal sensory branch, you just want to know that it becomes subcutaneous. This is going to be eight to nine centimeters proximal to the radial styloid. So that is both testable and practical. If you want to do a dorsal sensory branch block, you're going to go about eight to nine centimeters proximal to the radial styloid and inject there. Moving on, let's do the compression thing again, Alec. Yeah. So we need to think about where these branches can be compressed. The radial sensory nerve, when it compressed, It can cause a lot of pain and aggravation for a patient, and this is called Wartenberg syndrome. This is not to be confused with Wartenberg sign, which we talked about. And let's remember, Wartenberg sign is where the ulnar nerve is compressed, and you get persistent abduction of the small finger when attempting to adduct the fingers. Remember, it catches in your pockets. Wartenberg syndrome is compression of the radial nerve between the brachioradialis and the extensor carpe radialis longus. This is a purely sensory syndrome, which leads to paresthesias and pain in the superficial radial sensory nerve distribution. So you get numbness and pain in the dorsoradial fingers, the thumb, and the dorsoradial hand and wrist. Pain is reproduced by forearm pronation and ulnar wrist flexion. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great one to know and highly testable. The next syndrome you need to know about for the radial nerve is actually the EIN syndrome or posterior interosseous nerve syndrome. So obviously affecting the PIN, common sites of compression. There's a few. One is actually at the arcade of froze, which is the most superior and superficial aspect of the supinator. One of the other places it can get entrapped is the ECRB tendon edge, the edge of the supinator as well or at the leash of Henry. And what the leash of Henry is, is actually recurrent radial vessels that fan out across the PIN at the level of the radial neck. And with them being there, that creates an edge that can actually entrap the PIN. So remembering that the PIN is responsible for no cutaneous sensation, but rather almost all of the extensors. So your common extensors, and then the deep extensors, the supinator and the ABL, the EPB, EPL, EIP. You're going to have weakness with thumb and finger extension, and you're going to have a lack of cutaneous sensory deficits. All right, let's move on to the brachial plexus. And drawing the brachial plexus out on exams is always useful for me because I tend to get lost in the sauce when reading these questions. Some of the highly testable situations are the following. Trunk injuries. You can have upper or superior trunk, C5 through C6, middle trunk injury, C7, or lower trunk injuries, C8 to T1. Usually, these happen as a result of traction. You can also have avulsion injuries, which can be preganglionic and rupture or stretch injuries, which are usually postganglionic. For brachial plexus trunk injuries, Casey, why don't we go over a few of the commonly tested patterns? Yeah, so first is going to be the upper or superior trunk. Like you said, these are roots from C5 and C6. And this leads to herbs or herb Duchenne palsy. 
So some of the deficits you're going to see with this, you're going to have deficits from the axillary nerve, which is C5 and C6, part of the muscular cutaneous, which is C5, C6, and C7, and then the median nerve as well, which is made up, like you said earlier, from C6 all the way down to T1, you can have variable levels of signs from the median nerve. Some of the common ones are going to be shoulder instability and unable to abduct the shoulder, as well as having changes in external and internal rotation. The muscles affected are usually the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, the deltoid, and the subscap. Elbow flexion can be weak, secondary to the biceps, brachialis, and the brachioradialis. And then also forearm supination is difficult, secondary to the supinator muscle. Treatment for this is going to be nerve transfers. Just kind of quick for shoulder stability, you can do a spinal accessory nerve transfer to the subscapular system. For the axillary nerve having shoulder abduction, you can actually take one of the tricep motor branches and transfer that to the anterior motor branch of the axillary nerve. And then you also need to address muscular cutaneous and elbow flexion, which there's a, a ton of nerve transfers that you can do for that. I recommend looking up all of the nerve transfer and tendon transfers for the upper extremity and hand and kind of picking out the ones that you know you're going to be asked. So Alec, in addition, you can also have C7 added into that upper trunk injury. What does that look like? Yeah. So when you add C7 into the picture, you start to see damage to the radial nerve. You can also see some damage to the axillary nerve as well. These injuries can be variable and you can see weakness in elbow, wrist extension, finger extension. You can also see sensory deficits in the proximal arm and then the radial nerve distribution, which we talked about, the radial side of the thumb, index, and middle fingers. Yeah. And then the last one, going over the C8, the T1 injuries coming from the lower trunk, you end up with weakness of hand intrinsics, as would be expected with ulnar nerve injury. The hand is usually supinated, the wrist is extended, and the fingers are clawed. Uh, you're going to have variable weakness of the extrinsic and finger extensors due to the radial nerve fibers. And then most of the sensory findings are going to be in the ulnar sided digits. With this, nerve grafting alone may not do well because of how long of a distance it takes. So usually you're going to have to do some sort of nerve transfer distally to help this out. Quickly, Alec, do you want to touch on the trunk and cords just very briefly that you could see in some of these vignettes? Yeah. Let's, let's wrap it up with trunk and cord. Some of these injuries you usually see in the vignettes, as Casey mentioned, where the patient suffers some form of penetrating trauma to the upper arm. In order to ace these questions, first step is just figure out which distal nerve branches are injured and what kind of deficits you're seeing in the patient. Then depending on what mix of nerve deficit, either motor or sensory you have distally, you can just trace it up and figure out what's injured proximally. The superior trunk and the middle trunk injuries can be sort of similar. You'll see deficits in the musculocutaneous branch, the radial and axillary nerve branches, and the median nerve deficits. The inferior trunk injuries, this usually results in axillary, radial, and ulnar nerve deficits. Then lateral cord injuries, this results in a musculocutaneous and median nerve deficits. And then finally, and probably the most highly tested is medial cord injuries, because this results in both a median and ulnar nerve deficit. So you can see a mixed bag of volar forearm pathology, which is fun for test riders. Yeah, that's uh, highly testable stuff. And like we said, I think that's about all the time we have for today. I really want to thank Alec for joining me. Once again, you've put in so much work on this, but also on the, the music for the podcast. So all of us really appreciate it. So there's a bunch of other topics that can be tested within this subset of questions. So one of the things we didn't really discuss were the tendon transfers and specifics behind nerve transfers. These topics are very intricate. And to maximize your points on the section, I just would recommend reviewing the most common and the recommended nerve and tendon transfers for different injuries. With that, I'd like to invite anyone who has access to the new social media app Clubhouse to join us. All the Loop Podcast members follow us. And on Sunday mornings at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time, join us for the Loop Brunch podcast. We're discussing all things education and plastic surgery. If you like this, you like our podcast, please spread the word, tell a friend, like us on Facebook, watch this on YouTube for supplementary photos and slides, and follow us on Instagram at The Loop Podcast to get in the loop.